Okay, Dr. Geiser has not seen these questions, so he's uh, working on the fly here. And Dr. Geisler, you gave uh, our audience a bit of a challenge last night. You told <laughs> them uh, if they could think of uh, uh, an example of relativism, you'd love to hear it. Well, we have some brave souls that have uh, <laughs> taken you up on that. First of all, we all know the old axiom, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Is this a relativistic truth? Uh, it's a category mistake. A uh, category mistake is this, uh, confusing two different categories like uh, blue tastes good. Well, blue isn't a taste, it's a color. Uh, beauty is a category of its own and truth is another category. So the question is confusing two categories. Beauty is that which being seen pleases. That's Thomas Aquinas' definition, but I think a good one. And truth is that which corresponds to reality. They're totally different categories. Okay, well, how about, how about the statement? <laughs> how about the statement, this is an old building? Isn't that a relativistic statement? Well, uh, this is an old uh, uh, building is a, is a statement about the building itself, and uh, it's uh, objectively... Uh, true or false, either it is or is not an old building, then you have to define what is uh, old. And as soon as you define what is old, then you can apply it uh, to the building and know whether or not uh, it is true or false. But if there's an undefined word in the statement, then you don't know what affirmation you're making. Uh, truth is something that's either affirmed or denied. And if you don't know the terms in the statement, you can't know what is being affirmed or denied. It's like me saying, uh, gurgly plops are 12 feet tall. You say, what? I said, gurgly plops. You say, what does that mean? I said, well, I don't know. Well, then, then, uh, then it's not making a meaningful affirmation. OK, I think we'll move on. <laughs> Next question. You mentioned this morning in your talk, uh, you referred to uh, people taking their blinders off. And so the question is, how can unbelievers take, their, uh, take off their blinders? In other words, how do you reason with people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness and interpret the evidence according to their own presupposition? Well, I think that's a misunderstanding of uh, the, uh, what the scripture teaches there. It's usually built on a misunderstanding of 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man uh, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. The word for, uh, uh, the word dekomai, the Greek word dekomai, means welcome. It doesn't say he doesn't understand it. It says he's not welcoming it. Uh, they do perceive, Dr. Fred Howe, who taught at Dallas Seminary, made this distinction in his book on apologetics. Unbelievers can perceive the truth. That's what Romans 1, 19 and 20 says. It's clearly shown to them. And they see it and they're guilty and go to eternal destiny uh, based on seeing it, knowing it and rejecting it. So they can perceive the truth, but they're not willing to receive it. Dekomai, they don't welcome it in their hearts. If the unbeliever couldn't understand the gospel, how could he ever believe the gospel? You have to understand it before you can receive it. Dr. Um, uh, let's see, what is his, uh, uh, Dr. Walt Kaiser tells this story. He said uh, he was taking a class in Romans from a liberal uh, Greek scholar, and everybody in the class was a liberal except himself. So he thought he'd ask him a good question one day. He said, uh, Professor so-and-so, would you tell me what Paul means by the gospel? And the professor went into a 45-minute discourse on the gospel that Walt Kaiser said, I've never heard anything better. It was so good that some of the students were getting convicted. And they were raising their hands saying, well, professor, professor, you don't believe that, do you? And he said, I wasn't asked that. I was asked, what does Paul mean by the gospel? I don't believe a word of it. So he obviously understood it. Uh, he, he perceived the truth, but he hadn't yet received the truth. Then the suppression, notice the Romans 118. 
They know the truth, but they're suppressing it. They're holding it down. So it's not a question their mind doesn't understand it. It's a question their will doesn't want to believe it. Many Christians seem to think that arguing for the absolute nature of truth proves Christianity. But many atheists believe in a correspondence theory of truth and the absolute nature of truth. But they also believe Christianity is wrong. How do we engage people who believe in absolute truth but perceive reality in a radically different way than Christians? We do what the Bible says. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1.18. Give a reason for the hope that's in you. 1 Peter uh, 3.18. Whatever things are true, think on these things. We, we use our mind to bring every thought captive to Christ. We give them a rational argument. And once the rational argument is given, then it's up to them to accept or reject. That's an act of the will. We can, apologetics only leads the horse to the water. Only the Holy Spirit can make them drink. Apologetics can just convince them that this is valid, that this is so. It can't convince them to believe in it. That's a matter of their will and the Holy Spirit working on their will. So don't think people are saved through apologetics. They aren't. But there's a big difference, and the difference is this. If there's an elevator with a light on and the floor looks solid and there's a 300-pound man getting off and the elevator over here with no light on, you can't even see the floor, nobody getting off, which is the safest one to get into? Christianity says take a step of li uh, in the light, the light of the evidence. Don't make a leap in the dark. But you still have to take the step of faith. It's only able to bring you to the point where you know that something is true. It cannot convince you to believe in it. Okay, number five. While Christians believe truth is absolute, we hold vastly different interpretations of Scripture on various issues. The questioner states, I have encountered some frustration with the dogmatism of many uh, Christians. And here's a question. While Christians are justified in arguing for the absolute nature of truth, should there not at the same time be humility about our finitude and general inability to discover truth? I was at a Bible conference uh, for uh, pastors in uh, Muskegon, Michigan, many years ago, and uh, another gentleman and I were having a friendly dialogue on a certain topic, and obviously we didn't agree, so I thought I'd ask him a couple questions. One. Do you believe the Bible is the infallible word of God? He said, yes. I said, well, then if your view is in accord with the Bible and mine isn't, then you'd be right and I'd be wrong and vice versa. Right. I said, okay, um, do you have an infallible interpretation of the Bible? He said, yes. I said, I'm in trouble. I'm talking to the Protestant Pope. I've got an infallible <laughs> Bible, but I don't have an infallible interpretation. I've changed my mind four times on who the sons of God at Genesis 6 are. I've held all four views over the last 40 years. I had to be wrong three times. I may be wrong now, see. So I thought I'd ask him two more questions. One, do you believe God is infinite? Yes. I said, well, good. He's not a finite goddess. He believes God is infinite. We got a lot in common. Then I asked the final question. Do you have an infinite understanding of God? Sure enough, he said yes. I said, I'm not talking to the Protestant Pope. I'm talking to God. He has... <laughs> Uh, an infallible interpretation of the infallible and an infinite understanding of the infinite, all I could say is, let's have coffee. <laughs> Here's a question that perhaps uh, touches a number of... Uh, people impacted by a postmodern ethos, and it's this. How do we respond to people who are not interested in our logic and our rational arguments? We don't assume that the postmodern view of man is right. We assume that the biblical view of man is right. And the biblical view says they're made in the image of God. Yes, it's fallen, but it's only um, effaced. It's not erased. They still have a mind. We're not brute beasts, as Jude says. They have reason. And regardless of the fact that their society and their culture has said that reason isn't invoked, you still reason with them. 
because they are still rational people and they can still respond to rational arguments in spite of the culture. So don't give up the biblical procedure of talking to people just because some postmodern philosophy says this is the way people are. Uh, they're living on borrowed capital. They still are made in the image and likeness of God. The Bible is still true. Uh, Paul reasoned with them in the synagogues, persuaded them. Uh, look at Acts 17. The word reason is used there twice, and he's persuading uh, them. He used an argument that convinced a lot of people because when you go to the last verse of Acts 17, it doesn't say what I was taught, and I was taught by people who never read the whole chapter. I'd never heard anyone when I was growing up uh, who's, who read the last verse of Acts 17. They'd always say, well, Paul failed there. He used apologetics and it didn't work. And he went over to Corinth and he, he said, I'm just going to know Jesus and Jesus only. And I'm going to give up apologetics. Balgona, that's baloney. Uh, <laughs> no matter how you slice it, the last verse says, some believed, some mocked, and some said, we'll hear you again. I hope for that response wherever I go, that some would believe, some would mock, and some would say, to hear, hear you again. Among whom was a philosopher, uh, Dionysius, you remember, and Damaris, a woman and many others. So Paul didn't fail there. He used the, uh, this method. When he was talking to heathen, he'd start with nature, uh, Lystra, Acts 14. When he was talking to the Jews, he would start with the Old Testament. And then he'd reason from there. When he was talking to the Greeks, he'd start with and quote some of their uh, philosophers. When he was talking to believers, that was Acts 17, A and B. When he was talking to believers, he'd quote Jesus and the Old Testament, Acts 20. Start where they are and take them where they need to go. Which argues we need to know a little bit about our audience. Yeah. It's not enough to know the content of the gospel. You have to know the context in which you preach it. It's not enough to know the message. You have to know the milieu. It's not enough to be anchored to the rock. You've got to be geared to the times. This next question, um, I think, comes out of um, a passing reference you made to Ephesians 4 last night. The question is this. How do you balance the apostolic mandate to speak the truth in love, or as 1 Peter 3.15 says, to make a defense with gentleness and respect? Well, uh, I'll change the question, because uh, the question uh, should be, how should we balance it? None of us are perfect in balancing that, so I don't want to tell you how imperfect I am at doing it. Uh, so I'll answer the theoretical question. I mean, how do we do it? How should we do it? The Bible says we should do it. Uh, we should be frank but friendly. That we should speak the truth, but we should speak it in love. Uh, the best balance of it is Jesus. And I just wrote a book titled The Apologetics of Jesus. And my recommendation would be get the book and read it. All the proceeds go to help needy children. Mine. So <laughs> get the book and... I should start writing books. <laughs> <laughs> this question asks, um, first of all, makes a statement and then asks a question. In many cases, Christians seem to begin with the conclusion and then try to show evidence for it. And the, the, the questioner gives an example, and he, and he made the point that he or she made the point that uh, he, he doesn't necessarily want to focus on the example, but the bigger um, point. So the example is, no matter uh, what we are told by physicists or geologists, etc., some of us will not accept that the Earth is more than 10,000 years old. So again, the, the, the statement is, we begin with the conclusion and then try to show evidence for it. How do we justify this approach? Well, there's nothing wrong with the approach. It's not necessary to do it that way. Neither is it uh, forbidden to do it that way. The point is the bottom line. You can begin with the truth and then examine whether these things are so, like the Bereans did in the book of Acts. Or you can begin 
uh, with just looking at the evidence and then coming to a conclusion. You can jump in either place you want to, but make sure that you look at the evidence and you look at the evidence with an open mind. Why is it possible to change your view? I've changed my uh, view on many things in the Bible over the last uh, 59 years that I've been studying it. Why is it possible? Some of them I had my mind pretty much made up at because it was possible even though I had my mind made up, I was able to put that aside and say, well, let me look at this evidence here. And I looked at the evidence and lo and behold, I was wrong and I changed my view. So that's the way we should do it, no matter where you start. Uh, for example, uh, when I started out, I'm a, a pre-trib, pre-mill dispensationalist. I believe in all seven dispensations of the Schofield Bible with the footnotes. You know, So uh, that's my belief. But I, when I first uh, uh, drew the charts and had them spread across the front of the auditorium, I had each dispensation with a straight line between them as though you know, one ended and that was it. And then later I discovered, hey, you know, the age of uh, uh, conscience is still with us because we still have a conscience. Human government is still with us because we still have human government. Then I began to diagram it differently. I didn't give up believing there were these different ages and different tests. I believed that they built on each other. It was more like a staircase than it was a straight line. How did I do that? It's, it's what's called retroduction. Read our Systematic Theology, Volume 1. Read the chapter on methodology. You start out by doing an inductive study of the Bible. Uh, for example, the Bible teaches there's one God. Uh, the Bible teaches there are three persons who are God. Then you do a deduction, and you say, well, there must be three persons and one God. Then you take that deduction back to the Scripture and let all of the Scripture uh, nuance it, help you to better understand it. That's called a retroduction. It's like a snowball going down the hill. Every time it goes down, it picks up more because it's bigger, and then it picks up more as it goes down. So look at that chapter on methodology, and you will see that there are different stages, induction, deduction, reduction, which enhances uh, your belief, and then you come to a conclusion that is broader and wider and more biblical than you had before. The next question apparently comes from a mathematician. So here we go. In mathematics, there are problems that have more than one correct solution, and the solutions may even be opposite. For example, a positive number has two square roots of the same magnitude, but opposite in sign, one positive and one negative. Does the multiplicity of solutions in mathematics have any parallels in spirituality? When can we determine when there is only one possible solution to a spiritual question? You must remember mathematics starts with presuppositions and mathematics dealing with the abstract, uh, not the concrete. For in instance, there are an infinite number of points between my two fingers. There are an infinite number of points now. There are an infinite number of points now. But you can't get an infinite number of sheets of paper between my two fingers, no matter how thin they are. So when you're dealing with the concrete, it's a different world than dealing with the abstract. They're starting with diff different presuppositions. Riemannian geometry, you start with the presupposition that parallel lines can meet in infinity. You start with that presupposition, you're going to get a different conclusion than you're going to get in uh, the regular uh, geometry, because regular geometry, parallel lines don't meet. So the reason they can come to different conclusions is they start with different definitions, different presuppositions. Uh, when we're dealing with truth, we're supposed to be starting with either from general revelation or special revelation, truth statements, not just abstract, because abstractly you can get an infinite number of moments uh, before, before today. But you can't actually get an infinite number of moments before today. It's called the Kalam argument. Because if today is the end of all moments, actual moments before today, and an infinite can't have an end, then the universe can't be eternal. It's a good argument for the existence of God. Mathematicians look at them and they say, well, you can have an infinite number. Yeah, an infinite number of abstract moments, but not an infinite number of concrete moments. Because you can't end in infinite, and today is the end of all moments before today. 
another question related to atheism. Is there any fundamental flaw with affirming the absolute nature of truth and denying God's existence? Absolutely. Read St. Augustine's uh, book on free will, in which he gives an argument for the existence of God, calls it a proof from truth. Because if there's absolute truth, there has to be an absolute mind. Because truth is an idea, and ideas only exist in mind. And if there's an absolute truth, there must be an absolute mind in which the truth resides. The next question is not asked really from a philosophical point of view, but more a pastoral point of view. How do you answer the famous question, if God exists, why is there pain and suffering? Again, at a more pastoral level for someone who has lost a loved one. What are two ways to approach that? There's the rational approach, which C.S. Lewis did in his book, The Problem of Pain. That's an excellent answer. And then there's the more personal approach, which he did in his book, A Grief Observed, uh, when his wife died. And uh, you have to approach the uh, question entirely differently. You don't give rational arguments to someone who, who's suffering. What they need is as an arm around them. They need love. They need prayer. They need, they need counseling. Now, I know because I've experienced both. I've experienced the rational. I've debated atheists for 25 years, university, and that's very comfortable. I think their argument is wrong because they can't even get their argument off the ground unless there's a God. How do they know, as C.S. Lewis said, and this is what converted him, how do they know there's injustice in the world and therefore no God? Injustice means not just. That means you must know what just is. So you'd have to have an absolute moral law saying thou shalt always be just and an absolute moral lawgiver before you could even get your argument off the ground. So it's circular. And then I know the existential level too. And the existential level is when someone who's close to you dies. My daughter uh, died. Uh, and I had buried my father. I would buried my mother. I would buried my sister. I had been pastoring since 19... Uh, 54. I thought I had seen everything, but when a child dies, you haven't seen everything until a child dies. And I felt the existential uh, force of that. I was out making funeral arrangements with my wife, four of my friends, John Ankerberg, Ravi Zacharias, uh, Josh McDowell, and Kanegraf had calls on the phone, leaving me with some words of comfort. John Ankerberg, I don't know if he was just intuitive at it or, or what, but he said the best things and the most comforting things. Number one, I love you. Number two, I'm sympathizing with you. Number three, I'm praying for you. And number four, which was the great surprise, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. That was so comforting to me, I cannot express it. The other things that were comforting to me is exactly what Romans 15, 4 says that we, through patience and comfort of the scripture, might have hope. I had memorized hundreds of verses when I was in Bible school, and I went to Bible school for five years, the best part of my education. I had memorized hundreds of verses. So I knew verses, and when I woke up at night uh, crying, I could quote them to myself. And quoting the scripture to me was a great comfort. I knew the words from great hymns and choruses that had biblical truth, and I'd wake up singing them uh, to myself, God is love, God is light, God is faithful day and night. Uh, he is eternal, he never changes, though the seas rise up and swallow mountain ranges. Uh, scripture, uh, friends, uh, hymns, uh, that's how you approach somebody who's uh, suffering. How would you approach an unbeliever in a, in a similar kind of scenario? Uh, the same way. I approach unbelievers the same way because they're not immune uh, from that. They need love. They need uh, prayer. They need uh, 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 comfort. They need encouraging uh, words. And I'd approach them exactly the same way. Uh, when I started pastoring in 1954, my first funeral was an 86-year-old atheist. An 86-year-old atheist. What do you say at an atheist uh, funeral, you know? Uh, well, I learned from my pastor, you don't preach to the dead. Uh, that's too late. It's the point on the man wants to die after this is judgment. Preach to the living. So I preach the same way. Uh, 
comfort them with uh, scripture, comfort them with uh, hymns, comfort them with, uh, uh, with your love and with your concern uh, for them, and then you have a chance to win them to the Lord. Thank you. How does a young Christian in secular academia function and relate to a body of believers who do not understand or sympathize with his or her daily intellectual struggles? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I would say to young people in the secular world, uh, be sure and uh, uh, read uh, the book by uh, J. Bujachevsky, How to Keep Your Faith in College. J. Bujachevsky was an atheist who was converted to Christianity, much like C.S. Lewis, from the uh, problem of evil, there must be a moral law and there must be a moral law giver. And he's written some excellent books, uh, uh, The Law Written on Their Hearts from the University, uh, and his book uh, uh, on, uh, I, I just think his Revenge of Conscience book, part one, is a C.S. Lewis quality type book, a great uh, book. So you start by getting yourself prepared for college. And remember, you're going to alien territory. This is the enemy's ground. They're out to destroy your faith. Uh, I know I've been uh, debating them. I remember once at Temple University in Pennsylvania, I was debating atheists, and after the debate, I went over to shake his hand and just make small talk with him, and he took a couple of steps back, and he said, let's not fool each other. We're out for the hearts and minds of these young people. And they are, and uh, they're getting most of them too, because there's no competition between somebody who's come through our churches that have been holding hands for Jesus for 18 years and not learning much theology and uh, hardly any apologetics to go into a university complex uh, like that. That's like going to fight a world-class army when you've never uh, even uh, been to boot camp. Uh, so remember that. And then secondly, that's, that's your primary battle there. Get attached to a, uh, a church. Get attached to a good Christian group on campus. Get well-trained in, in apologetics. Get some good apologetic material. How do you communicate this to the uh, people back home? Give them some of, uh, uh, give them some of the uh, evidence. Give them uh, uh, what's going on, what you have to daily face. Show them. We had missionaries who we supported for years, and their missionary letters were glowing. They were just wonderful. I said, you know what? I don't even feel like giving a penny to you, let alone praying, because everything's okay. I said, why don't you tell me what's really going on? The next letter, they got robbed. A poisonous snake was in her kitchen. They got bit by. I said, that's the kind of letter I need. We need to hear what's really, really going on. Now I feel like praying for you and feel like uh, sending some support to you. So tell them. Uh, well, tell them what's going on in the college. It's, uh, it's a rough world. I was in eastern Tennessee speaking at the university there, and there was an atheist who came to my lecture. He didn't say boo, didn't ask a question. But, of course, he'll go back to his class and attack it. All I said to the students, uh, who is he? They said, well, he's the Bible teacher. I said, he's an atheist and he's your Bible teacher. I said, well, what are you learning? They said, well, he won't let us bring a Bible to class. So that's where our tax dollars are going, to have atheists teach our kids the Bible when well, no Bible can be uh, taken uh, to class. They're, they're in a really tough situation and uh, you need to convey that to your parents. Ask for prayer. Uh, be in touch with somebody who can get answers because you're going to get questions you can't answer uh, while you're there and uh, pray, pray for your uh, parents and pray for those who uh, don't really understand how tough it is. I've heard that Emmaus Bible College has a pretty good one-year program that might help people prepare for college. While we're giving commercials, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a, uh, on the table downstairs, there's uh, the, a, a a thing called 12 points, and it's a whole apologetics course in 12 lectures. So each of them is an hour lecture. It gives you everything you need to know in 12 hours, like is uh, truth absolute, the opposite of, opposite of truth, uh, false, does God exist, all the arguments, everything, how do we know Christ is the Son of God, the Bible is the Word of God. Get that. Study it. There's a book that goes with it. Go on my website, normgeisler.com and just uh, hit books and tapes, then you'll get a book titled, Atheism is Dead, Sign God. I had God sign it for me uh, <laughs> there. Atheism is Dead, Sign God, and that goes through all of those 12 points step by uh, step and gives you something that you can sink your teeth in to defend your faith. 
This next question comes out of your talk this morning. Did you say that a person cannot be saved by the work of Christ without knowing the facts of Christ? If so, what about Old Testament believers? Okay, that, I did say that, uh, and, uh, you, and there's a whole chapter on that in uh, volume four of my Systematic Theology, uh, I think it's chapter 17, if you're interested in more detail. But the old uh, revelation is progressive. And not everyone, if you had gone up to, let's say, the people in the streets of Nineveh who had just gotten saved, you know, a big revival broke out. Biggest revival in history. Do you know any revival where one man preaching five words in Hebrew, eight in English, brought down a whole pagan country and the revival lasted for 150 years until the book of Nahum when they were finally destroyed? I don't. I, that's got to be the greatest revival in history. And remember, Jonah started that revival by going to the University of Wales. Remember that? <laughs> and and he, he got a master of revival by repentance after a three-day course. You don't, you don't want that course. Uh, so in the Old Testament, if you go, go up to these people in the streets of Nineveh and say, um, can you recite the four spiritual laws for me? They wouldn't know how to do that. Oh, do you know that Jesus is going to die for your sins and rise from the dead three days later? I mean, they obviously had less of the content. Now, there's only one gospel. Galatians 1.8, let any other uh, gospel be uh, cursed. But Galatians 3.8 says that gospel was preached to Abraham. You look back in Abraham's gospel, and you have to really read into the text to say that all these Old Testament saints had explicit knowledge that Jesus was going to die for their sins and rise from the dead. I know about Psalm 16 and Psalm 2 and, and uh, Isaiah 53 and all of that. I'm talking about the average Joe Blow in the Old Testament. Did he know all of that? No, Revelation was progressive. But in the New Testament, it's very clear, Acts 4.12. And Acts 17 says, the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men to repent. So in the progress of Revelation today, it is absolutely necessary to know the content of Jesus' death and resurrection. For you, how do we know those verses said so? In the Old Testament, Hebrews 11, 6 applies to them. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. They didn't have to have that explicit knowledge. Some Christians are now arguing that, that Scripture needs to be understood as narrative, not propositional truth. It contains truth, but is not the truth. How do you respond? Uh, negatively. Uh, <laughs> even parables have propositional truths in them. Jesus was trying to, trying to teach the truth in the parable, and that truth is propositionalizable. So every truth claim is, prop, is a proposition. The Bible is filled with truth claims. Some are given by illustration, some are given by uh, examples, some are given directly in discourses, but it's all propositions and it's all propositionalizable. I don't mind people talking about narratives, uh, but it's like the uh, Anglican uh, or the Episcopalian rector who was sitting in one of my classes. I was teaching uh, a relatively liberal group of students that Jesus was the only way. I uh, gave him the lecture similar to the one I did today here on pluralism. And so he raised his hand. He said, uh, are there any stories in Islam? I said, not really many, just little sermons. He said, that's what I like about Christianity. It's got great stories. And I said, yeah, and they're true. So I don't mind people studying the narratives as long as they realize they're true. Do you realize that all the disputed narratives in the Old Testament, Jesus and his disciples personally verified were historically true? Jonah and the whale? It's not a whale of a tail, it's a tail of a whale. How do I know? Matthew 12, 40 to 42. Just as Jonah was, strong contrast, even so I will be. Now he's not saying just as you believe this mythology about Jonah, I'm going to tell you the historicity of my death and resurrection. He reaffirmed the existence of Adam and Eve. They came to him with a literal question about literal marriage and divorce. And what did he say? God literally created Adam and Eve. So if Adam and Eve aren't literal... Then the doctrine of depravity, the fall of man, salvation, 
marriage, the church. Do you realize there are about eight fundamental New Testament doc, uh, doctrines that are based just on the literal historical nature of Genesis 1 and 2? To say nothing of Jonah and the flood, Matthew uh, 24. I counted once, it's in, in my, uh, one of my books. 20 of the first 22 chapters of Genesis, Jesus and his disciples quoted something out of every one of those chapters as historically true. So narrative's fine, but you start demythologizing to say it's only a narrative, it's only a story, it's not important. And to show you how far this has gone inside evangelical circles, when I was teaching at Dallas, it would have been somewhere between 85 and 89, a book came out uh, by Moody Press, the name you can trust. And I publish books uh, with Moody Press, and I'm not knocking them, I'm just showing you how far this goes. And uh, one of the Moody uh, faculty had written a, a commentary on Jonah in which he said, it is not necessary to take Jonah literally. So I, I wrote uh, the author uh, first, and I said, Jesus took Jonah literally. It's necessary for us to believe what Jesus believed. Therefore, it's necessary to take Jonah literally. I like syllogisms. I think in syllogisms. Uh, and uh, he, he responded very poorly, I might say, uh, and missed the whole point. Uh, I wrote the administration of the school, and I noticed the next edition of the book, it didn't have that in, so apparently it was uh, successful. But hey, if Jesus took it literally, it's necessary for you to take it literally too. Uh, because if Jesus was wrong in anything he taught, he can't be the Son of God. So all of this stuff about uh, allegorizing and mythologizing these things, or they're great stories, but just take the point of it. Hey, the point is, Jesus based his teaching on those things, and, and uh, his teaching about his death and resurrection and his second coming. Just Matthew 12, Jonah, and Matthew 24, and the flood, uh, for two, four uh, starters. So I, I look very negatively on people who... Uh, are talking about mere narratives or mere stories as opposed to stories rooted in history. We have a couple of ethical questions. The first one is, how would you contend against same-sex marriage and for heterosexual marriage, especially given the divorce rates among Christians? Well, when I'm in a secular university, I don't bash them over the head with the Bible. Here's what I say when I get that question. Uh, uh, give me an argument against same-sex marriage. Number one, you didn't get here that way. That's my first argument. That's, that's all I say. Number two, if all of you got on an island within a generation, none of you would be here. Just think about it. It's contrary to nature. Doesn't it say in Romans 1, it's contrary to nature? And number three, the plumbing doesn't fit. Okay, next question. <laughs> Do you believe that Exodus 1, 15 through 18, which describes the Hebrew wives' response to Pharaoh when he gave the edict that they should kill the Hebrew male babies, and Joshua 2, the story of Rahab, allow Christians in some situations to lie? Yes. Next question. And I'll give you my reasons. Uh, remember the Corey Tin Boom story? She's been abused in this uh, prison camp, and then uh, they're being released, and they have to sign a statement, and it says, sign here that you've been treated humanely. And she pauses for a moment, and you can see in her mind all of the abuse that's going on, and then she signs her name and leaves. Uh, remember the story about... Uh, do you have any other radios here? And they said, no, lied to save the lives of the Jews. I mean, there are people uh, who wouldn't do this, and I respect the view, but here's the question I ask people who wouldn't lie to save a life. Why do you leave your lights on when you go away? You're lying to save your lamps. 
Why wouldn't you lie to save a life? You're lying to save your jewels. Why wouldn't you lie to save a Jew? See, there, is, there are higher and lower laws. And when the higher law and the lower law come into conflict, truth-telling and life-saving, you always choose the higher over the lower. Just like when two of the Ten Commandments come in conflict. I faced that when I was 17. My parents weren't Christians. They said, my mother didn't say, just stop going to church. She said, you must give up this Christian nonsense, and if you don't give it up, I'm going to beat you to death with this poker. She's shaking a poker from our uh, stove in my face. And I said, Mom, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And Jesus said, if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. There's a higher and lower law, and sometimes they come into conflict. And when they do, you always obey the higher and suspend your obedience to the lower. Next couple of questions relate to Islam. Does the growth of Islam argue that naturalism, relativism, and pluralism may not be as big a threat as we have made it? Well, uh, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, it seems like a contradiction. And I think we're talking about two different groups of people because we, we've got a mixture in the world today. I'm talking about American secularism when I talk about uh, naturalism and relativism and pluralism. Uh, when you're talking about Islam, I would say that's the greatest threat in the world today. And the reason it's the greatest threat is because it's the second largest religion, now the fastest growing religion, not because of converts, but because while we're having less than two children per family, they're having eight. You know how long it will take them to take over the world? If you and I don't start having more kids and getting more converts? I'm serious about this. Go home and get some more kids. Uh, uh, I, I, I've got six, uh, and you should have at least six. They're out, they're out populating, they're out populating us, and uh, within one generation, they're going to have taken over Europe and much uh, of the world. So it wouldn't be so bad if they weren't a violent religion, but they're a violent religion in which their book tells them, kill people that convert from your uh, truth, kill people that don't that believe in things like the Trinity and all this blasphemous stuff of Allah having partners. I wrote a book on Islam in 1983 called Answering Islam. It was one of the first books on the topic, uh, and my co-author was a converted Muslim. He used a pseudonym on the book. I used my real name. He was afraid that he was going to get killed. People told me, don't use your real name. You might be too, but you know what, what happier thing could happen uh, to you? It's like sticking your gun. Uh, a guy stuck his uh, gun in the gut of a Christian and said, give me your money or I'm going to kill you. He said, you can't threaten me with heaven. Threaten me with something else, but you can't threaten me with heaven. You know, think of torture or something like that. But, uh, so I'm not afraid. But in this book, we said it's the greatest threat in the world today. And between 1983 and 9-11, uh, I crisscrossed the country saying this is the greatest threat. And uh, f for all those years, I kept preaching less and less because it was falling on deaf ears and nobody was listening. And then the bomb hit. Now, the book had sold. Uh, only 20,000 copies in those years, which is not a world's bestseller. In the next, uh, uh, for eight years, in the next eight weeks, it sold 20,000 copies after 9-11. This is the greatest threat in the world today. Go on the internet and find out this little, there's a little clip about Islam and world population. And uh, it's on YouTube, you can get it. And just read, it will scare the devil out of you because this is showing the cold, hard facts of why we're losing the battle numerically, and it will just be a matter of time before they take over. They don't even need to get converts that they have. So I think uh, you're absolutely right. The Islam is a threat. And how can we reconcile these parallel things going on? Because the secular humanism is creating a vacuum, and a moral vacuum, in which Islam comes. CNN, which is a, is a liberal news uh, channel, actually was giving a favorable report of an African country that was in such chaos until the Muslims came in and took over. In other words, they were saying Islam 
is better uh, than the chaos they was have, having before. If you talk to people who have converted, you will find that they believe the same thing. And the more that liberal, uh, the more that naturalism and relativism and pluralism break down our society. There are only two things uh, that can really change that. One, a religion of fear, Islam that says you need something because you don't have any moral structure at all. Or two, a religion of love called Christianity. And if we don't beat them to the punch, uh, they're going to punch us uh, with Islam and we're all going to be studying the Quran in Arabic. I think we have a new tagline for our next ISI brochure. Go home and have some more kids. Amen. <laughs> Blessed is a man has his quiver full of them. And I have my quiver full and my wife is quivering. <laughs> this is a related question. Muslims don't seem to worry about postmodern thought in their drive to world religious domination. Why should we who have the Spirit of God in us be so concerned about understanding postmodern thought? Will not God enlighten a seeker's heart? Well, there, there are two good points there. And one is, remember this, it helps them. Because the more it breaks down society, the more it says, see, you need us. You need, you need Sharia law. We don't have that under Sharia law. Well, of course they don't. But when our soldiers took over Afghanistan, in the middle of the soccer fields was a barrel of hands. Because at halftime, they just cut off the hands of the people who were stealing. But if you want Sharia law, uh, then uh, you're welcome to it. But anybody who knows anything about it knows that it's going to be a horrible alternative. So postmodernism feeds right into it. And liberal Christianity. They love liberal Christianity. Why? Because it teaches them the same thing they believe. You can't trust the Bible. You don't, you, you don't really know. Jesus didn't really claim to be God. He was just a, a man. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They love it. Uh, because then they can come along and say, see, we've got a revelation from God, word for word, from the golden tablets in heaven dictated by Gabriel Angel to Prophet Muhammad, and uh, uh, it's not been corrupted one iota since then. It makes a great line. This is a question that uh, I think is looking for a little advice. So where do you suggest we start in teaching our young people in our assemblies to stick with absolute truth. So before they even go off to college, uh, what are some suggestions you would have for parents and church leaders? Uh, the Truth Project is a good uh, program. Get that and uh, read it. It was put out by Dobson. They put millions of dollars into it. Uh, the, uh, any of the uh, things that have been done by uh, David Noble, the uh, book on understanding the times is an excellent uh, uh, book and they're uh, retreats, they have two week things with uh, teenagers. They don't entertain them. They inform them, they instruct them, they challenge them. They're taking classes eight hours a day, taking exams, memorizing uh, verses, and they're lined up. People are lined up waiting to get in to this. So they need to get into some worldview studies. The uh, understanding of times is one, one of the best. Uh, the Truth Project is a, is a good one, and there are a number of them around the country. So I would Start there or get, get our uh, book, the, those 12 points, the, the videos and the book that goes with it and get them trained in it. They, you'd be surprised. They're smarter than you think they are uh, and they, they love this more than you think they would uh, love it. There are, there are a number of questions along uh, the lines of this next one and it has to do with... Um, your own ministry. Can you tell us about some of the people that were saved after listening to your debates over the years related to that? Another question says you've talked a little about some of the scholars and intellectuals that have come to the truth after examining the evidence. Can you share with us some of the more striking examples and, and is there a common argument that is convicting to people that you have found? There is no one common argument. Different arguments appeal to different people, like you would expect if Francis Collins, who was converted from atheism, you would have thought that you know, the cosmological argument, the scientific evidence would be the greatest. It was the moral argument of C.S. Lewis that was more persuasive to him. So you never know, uh, depending on a person's uh, background. But in my experience o over the years uh, in debating atheists, and uh, many of them have... Uh, 
uh, subsequently become uh, believers and some of them became Christians. I was debating in a uh, university in Miami and some of these places they demand that no outsiders come in and they demand to take a vote after. So they voted, we debated atheism. The guy was a Harvard PhD in philosophy and the audience voted two to one in favor of uh, Christianity over atheism. They had a follow-up meeting. 14 kids were saved at the follow-up meeting and the atheist attended the follow-up meeting and he got up and said, you know, I'm not even sure what I believe anymore. Uh, so I don't know if he subsequently become a believer or not, but the guy named Richardson, who used to uh, defend the Moonies, has left the uh, Moonies uh, after we had a debate with him at Northwestern University. I debated an atheist once uh, who was uh, formerly a Christian, went to two Southern Baptist schools, became an atheist, and I debated him at the University of Texas, and he um, invited me over to his home, got his Bible out, asked me questions from uh, the Bible, uh, invited me to his class to teach his uh, uh, class. Again, I'm not sure he's become a believer, but I'll hear you again. Uh, some mock, uh, some believe. Uh, one of the uh, best debates we ever had was at University of Calgary, where we debated three and a half hours on humanism versus uh, uh, Christianity. The guy who was the other debater was a Berkeley professor, uh, and he had written 26 pages of articles. That is, it uh, took uh, uh, 26 pages just to give the titles of the articles. He was on the editorial board of, uh, of the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and we debated all that time, and the campus newspaper, and they took a vote after, and the audience voted three to one in favor of Christianity, and the campus newspaper read, Atheist Fails to Convert Campus Christians. Uh, I have a file full of letters that thick of atheists who have read one or more of our uh, books. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist uh, book, for example, and have become uh, believers and have written me to tell about it. So, yeah, it does work, and people do come, and uh, they come for different reasons, but uh, you, you give the case, you give the reason, and uh, let the Holy Spirit uh, use it to convince people, and you never know which one is going to convince them the most. Final question. What is your top recommended Norman Geisler book? <laughs> it's called Christ, the Theme of the Bible. Uh, it was the first full book that I ever wrote alone. My first book was General Introduction to the Bible with Bill Nix, 1968. And then... Uh, I wrote that uh, after. It's a Christocentric view of the whole Bible. It's my favorite book. It's a book I love the best, and it's been one of the poorest uh, sellers of uh, all of the book. But uh, Jesus wasn't popular in his time either, and if he came back today, we'd probably do the same thing, crucify him all over, because we couldn't stand somebody that perfect living in our midst. But seriously... Uh, there's nothing more important than the scriptures, and there's nothing more important than taking a Christ-centered approach to, to the Bible. And uh, it's just the book that uh, I, uh, I love the most. I wrote it in a snowstorm. We were snowed in and have anything else to do. Uh, I'd been teaching Bible survey for 10 years, uh, and I had all the material. Second like in my mind, I just poured it out. I think probably a week or a week and a half, I wrote the whole book, and uh, it's the book I love the most because it's the theme I love the most. Christ, the theme of the Bible, is later reprinted under the title uh, to understand Jesus, uh, to understand the Bible, look for Jesus. All right, well, thank you very much, thank Dr. Geisler. certainly appreciate your insight and your willingness to be with us. Let's close this time in prayer. Father, we are grateful again uh, to have had this opportunity to think carefully about difficult questions that we face in our world and that people are asking uh, our neighbors and folks in our churches. Give us the diligence and strength and enthusiasm to be careful students of your word, to be careful students of 
of our times, that we might understand them and be more faithful in them and proclaim the gospel more effectively. We would pray for uh, a reawakening in our country of, uh, of uh, people's minds and hearts to see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Uh, again, we thank you for our time and commit the rest of our day to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.